remember at school we were just basically taught um, the, the New Testament. I remember actually thinking it was a, a bit boring that it was the same story four times over and there were actually discrepancies between the different stories. And um, I think uh, if we'd studied the Old Testament I might have been more interested. Um, but uh, yeah, I wasn't, I wasn't particularly religiously brought up. And just you, in your book you tell some really horrific stories about the things done in the name of religion. What are the worst things that you've seen? Um, the, the the massive bombings, um, the beheadings, the, the, the shootings, the huge executions. Um, but what struck me and what almost wrote, uh, drove me to write the book was um, not just the, the horrificness of this, but quite often the absurdity of it um, and the bizarreness of it, the things that, um, that the human imagination can come up with and how religion fuels into that with its own sort of bizarre, macabre stories that um, have that element of absolute truth in them. Um, so, um, yeah, there were there were horrific things that I saw, but there were also absurd things that I saw. Um, one of the most absurd things um, being Al Qaeda ordering uh, shepherds to to, for, to wear, make their goats wear underpants um, for modesty's sake, so that uh, uh, young jihadists wouldn't be offended. Um, sheep didn't have to, because sheep have a tail that covers their their modesty. Um, uh, so there were actually people who were threatened with death because they didn't put underpants on their sheep. Um, is this female and male sheep or just... Uh, this was female, I think, yeah. Goats, <laughs> uh, Sorry, sorry, yeah, goats rather. Um, uh, so the goats in underpants was uh, probably the most absurd thing. But there was also the story of, um, of Mickey Mouse being taken over by Hamas in, uh, in Gaza um, and uh, turned into a, a sort of Islamic martyr. Um, this was a children's program where Mickey Mouse um, was tasked by his grandfather with taking back the house in Tel Aviv um, because Hamas doesn't uh, recognize Israel as a state. Um, so Mickey Mouse tried to climb across the Gaza fence this was, uh, last summer, this show went out, um, and was caught by the Israelis um, and on TV was beaten to death by Israeli interrogators. And it was, it was shockingly violent for children, but it was also just the absurdity of it. It was Mickey Mouse being beaten to death by an interrogator. Um, so it was just that sort of thing really struck me. It, it, it's not just isolated incidents. It's you know, it's this this mindset that sort of seems to pervade the Middle East, and that's that's partly what spurred me on to write this. And you, when you're time in Iraq, there's some horrific descriptions of people with their skulls split open, and completely innocent people shot as they're walking on the street, and bodies that need revolting, newly buried corpses being dug up by desperate relatives. I mean, what's the most awful thing that stands out in your memory like that? Or so? Um, I think possibly the bombing in Kabbalah in 2004, the Ashura festival. Um, there was about a million Shia pilgrims that showed up to this big uh, festival um, and about nine or ten Sunni suicide bombers got inside the crowd and blew themselves up um, and there were just bits of bodies lying in the middle of the, 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 the main square in Karbala. Um, we saw heads that had been blown off. Um, I saw a security guard pick up a woman's head and place it back on her body. Um, I mean, those were the most shocking things I think I saw with, with my own eyes. Um, uh, on, on the videos, I mean, the, the, the Al-Qaeda had a huge propensity for putting stuff on video. Um, and they would film the beheadings, which we had to watch. Um, uh, I think that was that was probably more shocking in a way, um, just because it was just somebody isolated. They knew what was coming. They'd been put in a cage. People like Kenneth Big, um, and we as journalists had to, to watch it, to describe it, uh, to see what the last words were, to yeah, we'll see how the whole thing happened. Um, and that was that was yeah, very deeply disturbing. Religion is at the root of all this, or is it man, man's own wickedness using religion as a convenient excuse? Yeah, I think um, I think it's the propensity of the human imagination to, to dream up ideas, whether they're religious or secular, um, to, to believe in ideologies, to be manipulated by other people. Um, so I think religion is a facet of that, but I don't think it's I don't think it's the be all and end all. I think it's um, you know it's, it's a major culprit throughout history as a channel for for, for yeah um, channeling man's darker side. Um, I think it makes it very easy to be manipulated by other people um, and to to create this absolutism, this lack of tolerance with, with other people. 
because we've seen um, political ideologies such as Nazism and communism uh, wreaking some of the same devastation mm. on their victims, if not worse in many respects. Mm. But religion seems to be the one consistent strand, doesn't it, through, mm. through most of history. Mm. But there, I mean, there's there's a, a whole theory about there's a common thread to the monotheistic religions with the, the secular ideologies that um, uh, the, the secular ideologies like communism, Marxism, took on this idea, this Judeo-Christian idea of um, if we sacrifice everything now, if we struggle, we fight, we kill, there'll be a better tomorrow, which is basically just the old idea of um, sacrifice now, um, crucifixion, whatever, martyrdom um, in favor of um, heaven tomorrow. Um, so there's, there's a certain similarity. Um, I mean, uh, philosophically, I think um, people are afraid of death. Um, and I think they invent things to try and cushion themselves against that, whether it's it's God or the nation, the sense of belonging, getting away from your individual isolation um, and burying yourself in something bigger than, the, than you is the sad individual who, you know, everyone you know will die one day. Um, and I think it's a way of, it's a coping mechanism that has gone horribly wrong in, in many ways that to avoid death you end up killing yourself. Um, I mean, I don't think suicide bombers really think they're going to die. Um, at least not the, the Islamic ones. Um, they, they think that they'll be in heaven with with Mohammed. In this, this Kabbalah Karbala incident, um, I spoke to a guy whose cousin had just been killed in a suicide bombing. And um, I said, I'm very sorry for your cousin's death. He said, why be sorry? I'm jealous. He's having lunch with Imam Hussein right now. He died in a holy city on a holy day, killed by evil um, wrongdoers. He, it's, it's a one-way ticket to, to paradise. And he was genuinely happy. So that, that idea that to avoid death you die just seems to be a, a, a warped, um, you know, the, the, the way ideologies or ideas have mutated across time. If, I mean, I don't suppose um, anyone could answer this question really, but what would your solution be to the present crisis in Gaza? Uh, that is very difficult. Um, uh, I think what Israel is doing is, is very dangerous because it's an idea, Hamas is an idea that is embedded in a civilian population um, and I think I think there's a lot of bitterness from what I've seen of Palestinians they're, um, they're becoming more and more angry um, I think Israel is going to emerge from this with not necessarily a peace partner to speak to I think the, the, the Fatah side has been um, has been uh, sidelined by the whole thing. But I think it's a very difficult question to, to do. How, how do you isolate extremism, militancy? Um, um, and it's it's not a, a new problem. Hamas, the problem for the international community was that Hamas was actually democratically elected in 2006. So um, they're not just a, a little group of extremists, they're actually a fairly popular group. Um, uh, I would think that the best way long term would be to some, find some way of diffusing the situation. Um, radicalizing the population, um, finding a way to open the frontiers between Israel and Gaza, between Gaza and Egypt, um, maybe getting the Palestinian Authority people to work on the borders. That's part of the plan at the moment, so that, um, so that aid can go in, so that life can become a bit more normal, and I think that will de-radicalize the population slightly.